Hello, I'm Dick Fleming, a former staff conference interpreter with the Skeek in Brussels. Now, I'm retired now, but I still do a little bit of training now and again. And I sometimes get asked by students of conference interpreting, and sometimes even by the teachers, uh, why students spend so much time on consecutive uh, at university compared to simultaneous, when later on, if they get that far, if they become professional interpreters, they're going to spend probably most of their time doing simultaneous. It's certainly how I spent most of my time when I was working in Brussels, uh, sitting in a booth, wearing headphones, uh, which is why now, after 35 years of doing that, I prefer not to wear headphones anymore when I, for example, go jogging. Uh, but it was certainly how I spent most of my time. But most, I say, not all of it. Some of the time, I was actually doing consecutive interpreting in the same room as the delegates, whether they were experts, diplomats, politicians, or, or even farmers meeting in small groups. And not only in the same room, sometimes in the same field, sometimes in the same farm or factory, uh, many different situations, in fact. The point I'm making is that from my own experience, consecutive interpretation is an essential part of the professional interpreter's toolbox, since you have to know how to do it. And because it is a conference interpreting mode that is still used, albeit not very much. And of course it can happen when you least expect it. The equipment can break down, or all of a sudden the nuclear fuel committee can decide to break up into two separate groups where they have to have consecutive interpretation. Or, for example, the mayor of the town you are visiting uh, suddenly decides to give a, a welcome speech. Uh, and perhaps the worst possible situation is when you're invited to a lunch uh, by the delegates who say, oh, do come along, there won't be any need for any interpretation at all. And then, sure enough, someone feels moved to give a speech. And Dooley taps his glass with his fork. You've got the dreaded sound of cutlery on crystal, signifying consecutive. And you have to do it. You can't opt out. You can't say you're not on duty or plead incompetence because you've had uh, one or two glasses of wine already. And you'd better do it well as well, because if you don't, people will notice. They will also notice it if you do it brilliantly, because you're on show. When you're working in consecutive, you're very much in the public eye and not hidden away in the booth. If you like, uh, it's uh, our activity under the public gaze. It's our visiting card in a way. So there are plenty of practical and professional reasons why conference interpreters should be able to do a decent consecutive, which means that you have to learn how to do it. Now, you may well say, well, what about the first conference interpreters who did consecutive? They didn't learn how to do it, did they? Um, because there weren't even any interpreting schools when they started back at the time of the Paris Peace Conference at the end of the First World War. True enough, uh, there weren't any schools. The first school was Geneva, which wasn't set up until 1941. So how did they learn? Well, they learnt the hard way, on the job, and it took them a fair amount of time. Um, we have uh, uh, record of uh, the famous Jean Herbert, uh, who was one of the first interpreters, uh, saying that he felt ashamed about uh, the first few times he interpreted, because he had never been trained. And it was only over time that he acquired the skills. And obviously, we can't do that. We can't say, well, I'm, I haven't really learnt it yet. You, you carry on talking and I'll see if I can pick it up. So, what do we have to do? We have to learn it. And we can learn it at interpreting schools. Having said that, I still haven't answered the question of why so much time is spent on consecutive compared to simultaneous at interpreting schools. Usually the same amount. There's usually as much time spent on consecutive as on simultaneous.
Well, the answer to that question that I believe most teachers of interpretation would give is that by learning consecutive, you learn how to interpret. And also that consecutive is a useful stepping stone to simultaneous interpretation later. Now, this argument is based on the premise that the interpreting process is similar whether you're doing consecutive or simultaneous. So what is that process then? Well, it involves listening, understanding, analysis of what is being said, sorting those ideas into chunks of meaning, linking those chunks together, and storing all this somehow, somewhere, before later reformulating it in another language. I say later, but later in the case of consecutive. And the obvious difference between the two is that. Uh, you have to perform all these operations virtually simultaneously in simultaneous interpretation, whereas that is not the case for consecutive, where at least one of the stages, that is the last stage of reformulating, comes later. Another difference uh, is that consecutive, given the time lag between listening and reformulating, means that you need a memory prop for the storage part of the process. And this is achieved by, by taking notes while you're listening. Whereas in simultaneous, uh, the interaction of short and long-term memory is all done up here. Now, given the problems that students often have with note-taking, you might well say that consecutive is just as difficult. But that's not really the point. The point is that in consecutive, reformulation is put off until later, thus slowing down and separating out at least part of the interpreting process. And this has the advantage of allowing the student to concentrate on certain parts of the process rather than having to work on all of them at the same time. In fact, it's one of the basic principles of learning that you should learn to crawl before you can walk and to learn to walk before you learn to run. Uh, don't get me wrong, a consecutive interpreting is not like crawling, it's not child's play, uh, which is why interpreting courses don't start with consecutive interpretation either. They usually break down the component parts of the interpreting process into uh, different stages, different skills. They start with work, for example, on active listening, understanding, discourse analysis, and public speaking, of course. And as students progress in these various areas, which are taken separately, you can start gradually combining them. And after a while, you would combine the, the listening approach, the an analysis process, with subsequent reformulation. By that time, you're already doing basic consecutive interpretation. Notes, in fact, don't come until later because they can affair, interfere with the listening process. And when they're brought in, they need to be eased in very carefully uh, so that uh, they, they don't interfere with the listening. And the way to do that is to separate out the note-taking from the listening. Uh, very often when notes are introduced, you don't ask the person to listen to a text, you ask the person to take a written text, to read it, and to try and take notes from it, which would reflect the structure of the speech, be an adequate memory prop, and also help you with your reformulation later on. Even if you don't actually do the reformulation then, you're just practicing taking notes from a text, again separating out the different skills. So, there are many different ways of introducing the different component parts of the interpreting process and different ways of combining them. And most teachers of interpreting would argue that this gradual approach, including the combination of skills in full consecutive interpreting, tends to develop the student's listening and analytical skills 
skills and also, and this is a crucial point I think, to prevent him or her from falling into the trap of literal reformulation from one language to another. You see, when, when students start off with simultaneous, even if they've been well prepared, there, there is sometimes a tendency to go for the simple solution, the, the literal one. For example, a public house might be rendered into French as une maison publique. Or one I remember myself saying uh, when a Frenchman giving a speech referred to le glacier. And in my version, this was turned into the glacier. Whereas my teacher was actually referring to the ice cream man outside playing his jingle. Now, I said this, I, I translated literally because I wasn't thinking. I wasn't used to that new situation of being in the booth with headphones on. Now, it's to avoid that temptation as much as possible that students are taught to listen, think and analyze before and during consecutive interpretation practice when everything is, as I said, slowed down and separated out. All of this before we try and put it all together in simultaneous. Uh, and where the reformulation phase in consecutive is sufficiently distant time-wise from the listening phase to prevent the source language contaminating the reformulation or target language. And ideally, even when simultaneous is introduced, we can still separate out the problems and skills involved in the process. We can work with texts which we are familiar with in order to remove the problem of not knowing what's coming, not knowing the big picture. That's one of the major problems and difficulties with simultaneous. We can work with short and relatively simple texts. And we can even work on individual skills such as abstracting, summarizing, paraphrasing and anticipation. So my point is that skills can be isolated and taught separately before being combined. And as I said, most teachers prefer to teach their students the slowed down or dragged out version of such a combination that consecutive amounts to. Consecutive also gives students more time to think about and to judge what they are doing right or wrong, and also to listen to what their peers are doing right and wrong in the same classroom. They even have some evidence on their notepad afterwards to check whether they were listening or analyzing properly. So although it may not be any easier to do a brilliant consecutive than it is to do a brilliant simultaneous, the whole process is laid bare for the student to observe. And this should make the learning process easier. So it's easier to learn and to self-assess. At the same time, laying bare the whole process makes it easier to, for teachers to assess what their students are doing and thus easier to teach. Now, some interpreters have said that teachers are just being lazy. They prefer teaching consecutive for that reason, that it's simpler, it's less teacher intensive and less equipment intensive. But as I see it, there's nothing wrong with that. If it is easier to teach than simultaneous, surely that's a good reason for starting with it. I would add that since it's easier to judge an interpreting performance when it's done in consecutive, for that reason, examination panels, particularly in the European Union, tend to set great store by the ability of candidates to perform well in consecutive, even if they know that later on they probably won't have to do very much of it. And I'd say that's more of a real politic argument uh, rather than a, a pedagogical one in favor of learning consecutive properly, but it's a very important one for candidates at a test. Another argument in favor of achieving a high degree of proficiency in consecutive is that it can, if you're lucky, be your passport to fast-track career development. If you're good at it, 
particularly if you have a Khotur language as well, you may be chosen to accompany high-level delegations on important trips abroad. Finally, I ought to point out that although I've concentrated on the teaching of conference interpreting in my little talk, we shouldn't forget that most of the interpreting done every day worldwide is not conference interpreting. It's public service or community interpreting done in hospitals, courts, immigration offices or, or police stations. There, simultaneous interpretation is virtually unheard of. And a mastery of consecutive interpretation, even if not always strictly necessary when the interpretation is done sentence by sentence, is a major asset for the interpreter working in that context. So, to sum up then, students at interpreting schools spend a lot of their time learning how to do consecutive interpretation, one, because it's still an essential part of the conference interpreter's professional skills. And doing it well can help to further that interpreter's career. Two, because most teachers of interpreting consider it to be not only an end in itself, but also a good lead-in to simultaneous interpreting, and also a more transparent and observable way of learning to interpret in general. And three, precisely because it is more transparent, test panels at major employers of conference interpreters still insist that candidates be proficient in it. Having said all that, it appears that there is as yet no conclusive empirical or research-based evidence to actually prove that achieving proficiency in consecutive before moving to simultaneous actually improves your simultaneous. So perhaps it's time that somebody tried to come up with the evidence, either to prove that or to disprove it. Either way. In the meantime, for those of you who are students of interpreting, I hope very much that you would enjoy learning to do a decent consecutive as much as I did. Thank you.